This is an actual play of the tabletop role-playing game Trophy by Jesse Ross. The incursion we're using is the Flocculent Cathedral by Jim Crocker. The purpose of this recording is to demonstrate how Trophy works, to show you the kinds of stories you can tell with this game, and of course to entertain you. One quick note, I get a rule slightly wrong during play. On a ruin roll, you have to roll higher than your current ruin score for your ruin score to go up, not equal to or higher like I say in the recording. It's a fairly minor thing, but I thought it was worth pointing out. This podcast series is a production of The Gauntlet, with editing by Sam Dunwald. The music is Chalet by Maidan. You can support The Gauntlet and help fund more great shows like this at our Patreon, which is at patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. If you're interested in Trophy, you can get the core rules of the game in Codex Dark 2, available on DriveThruRPG. If you'd like to try the Flocculent Cathedral, it can be found in Codex Hunger, which is also on DriveThru. We'll have links in the show notes. And with that, please enjoy Trophy, the Flocculent Cathedral. You eventually push past the tangle of mangroves into somewhat more open, swampy terrain. At the very least, you have a little bit of room to move around in now. And there's no longer a path. Fortunately, Cassian has a map, so it's all good. I promised you a condition, Orlin. And your condition is associated with the skillful use of your tongue. You find that periodically your tongue is involuntarily sliding back and forth in your mouth. (laughs) And at one point you notice it And when no one else is looking, you let it protrude completely. And you can see that the tip of your tongue has grown two snail-like feelers coming off the end of it. And so if you're not talking, your tongue will just sort of slide back and forth. How are you feeling about that? Uh, I think I'm convinced that the reed had something on it, like some sort of d- disease or d- magical ailment or, or something like that. And putting my mouth to it must have obviously been the cause. Indeed, indeed. It's quite late at this point. Um, I mean, it was dusk light when you were making your way past the brigands. And now that there's some gap in the tree coverage. You can see that the moon is getting high in the sky. And so you will need to stop, make camp, set a watch. I think you're probably all too exhausted to engage in anything more than (laughs) eating just whatever hard tack you brought and setting the watch and conking to sleep. But I nevertheless wanted to have a glimpse at it. Basso, how do you spend the evening around the not entirely necessary campfire, given how warm it is, but it is nevertheless there? I think there's probably a bit where you see Basso go over to the, the, the tree and kind of, he's so kind of gnarled that uh, he's shorter than maybe he ought to be. And he's maybe looking and trying to figure out if he could climb up and sleep in the tree, mm. but it's just like just out of his reach. Like, like he just can't quite get the purchase or anything to get up there and doesn't want to ask the others. So then he just kind of goes back and, and sits by where we're going to sleep. What about you, Cassian? Um, I think Cassian is actually like not having a good time exactly, but um, I think is is thinking like, oh, this isn't going too bad so far. Um, you know, I've heard rumors about how awful this place is and how dangerous it is, but, eh, you know, um, 
it's not that bad. If only Orlin would stop making those slurping sounds, things would be great. Orlin? Um, I think I am, like, very anxious. And if I wasn't so tired, it would be uh, hard to sleep. But I think uh, to avoid the fear of my, like eating my own tongue or something like that. I've like slept on my side as if I had like a hangover, did want to throw up and I've popped like something against my back so that I can't roll back and stuff like that. It's probably a very odd preparation <laughs> for sleeping. <laughs> I will tell you that periodically while you're sleeping, once you're sleeping, you'll briefly wake up uh, because something has tickled your nose. But then you just brush it off back into your mouth and go back to sleep. But let's set the watch. I mean, if you want the scene before you set watch, I'm happy to give you that scene. But otherwise, if you're ready to set watch, just tell me who's going first. I go first. Okay. You two go to bed. I'll watch over you. Don't worry. <laughs> Very comforting, boss. <laughs> Absolutely. It cracks his knuckles too. Does that thing like he can crack all of them and then he cracks his joints and his elbows and stuff and kind of stretches and sits down and then he cracks him again like he shouldn't be able to crack him again so fast but he does and then he sits sort of cross-legged and and waits nice i'm gonna pull the camera away for just a little bit to a nice aerial shot i know fraser appreciates my narrated camera work here there's a nice aerial shot some distance away but something was stirred by the goose call and we see the foliage rustling in your direction but that's something to deal with in the future basso your watch your watch passes Fairly unremarkably. But while I've got you, yeah. I do want to ask you a question. Tell us a little bit more about your past and why you need the absolution of the Justicars. Give us some more on that. What's going on there? I think as much as anything, I think we see... And I imagine he recalls bringing gear and armor to to sell, and it it being spotted, like like he tried to, to like pull or prize whatever seal or marker or house symbol was on it, and he, we we see him being being chased for that. Um, and we probably roll back to when he got the armor, when the person he was serving was knocked off his horse, the battle line had moved and was stuck in the mud and couldn't move. And his horse was, you know, dead next to him. And maybe I could have pulled him out, but I didn't. And maybe when I was trying to kind of pull him out, maybe I pushed his face in further and, and, you know, it's hard to tell whether it was just incompetence or deliberate before I pulled that armor off to try and get back to town and sell, you know, um, to just have some money to get away from all of this. I'm a deserter. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a thief of corpses. Uh, it's, it's all of that. And I think here I'd like to remind you of the shanty and I probably should have had you roll this earlier, but eh, it's okay to do it now. I think that because the verse so closely matched your story, I think it's going to provoke a ruin roll because it's probably a little disturbing. I imagine. Sure. Uh, go ahead and just roll your dark die. Okay. I'll use this yellow die. And if it's equal to or higher than your current ruin, then it goes up by one. Well, it definitely goes up by one. Because I rolled a five, and my ruin is at present a two, so it becomes a three. I will tell you that 
as you turn in for the night, you raise your right hand to see it better in the firelight, the now dim firelight mingled with moonlight. And you can see that a colony of very tiny bright red spiders has spun webs between your fingers and has taken up residence there. How do you feel about that? I've seen what insects do to bodies. Living and dead. Things that are half dead go around in battlefields that haven't quite died, that already the, the things have come to them. Um, and I suspect I lean over the coals and I hold my hand over the coals until I can't handle it anymore. Um, I probably end up scorching myself probably worse than, than, this, than, than anything else. And I think you'll even notice that some of the spiders will sacrifice themselves so that others may live. They cover each other from the heat as best they can. More noble than I. Cassian, are you on next watch? Yeah, I think so. That's the kind of the hardest watch is the middle one. It's the middle one, yeah, because it's the one you got to... You know, young and healthy, so I think I feel obligated to take it. Yeah. Your watch is going by fairly unremarkably. You're mostly just kept company by the buzzing of dragonflies and the croaking of bullfrogs and the occasional centipede crawling across a stone. And then you notice something that managed to escape the astute gaze of Basso. There is a, it's a little ways away, maybe a few hundred paces, but a sort of elevated little hill or promontory. And silhouetted in the moonlight, you see what appears to be a pair of young lovers sitting next to each other, leaning in to each other, as if to kiss or share a secret. What are you thinking? What do you do? Well, that's strange. I mean, I know it can't really be just two people out here, but I'm going to, I'm going to creep closer just in case, I don't know, they are people. Um, but I, yeah, I want to get a good look at this. I will tell you that I'd, I'd have you roll, but I'm not going to, because you don't get very far before you realize that they're not moving almost like they're statues. Like they're just like frozen in place. They might even be just like a natural feature of the swamp that your eyes are playing a trick on you. But do you get close enough to get a good look at it? Yeah. I'm starting to suspect they're just, you know, kind of oddly shaped stumps that Tree in the moonlight or, or yeah. buds. But yeah, since I've, I've come this far, I want to at least confirm that. You get closer to realize that they are in fact a pair of corpses. Okay, then. Two desiccated corpses sitting across from each other. The rotted remains of a picnic lunch laid out between them. And each has a hand placed in the other's mouth. And the hand is just filled with loamy soil. I want to ruin roll for me, please. Sure thing. Four, which is higher. So your ruin goes up by one? Mm-hmm. Goes up to three. First of all, what do you do once you see these two corpses? How do you make you feel? I think at first I like recoil and then like, no, don't be a coward. And I, I go up and kind of nudge them, you know, with my feet and look at them like, why this makes no sense. Who comes out here just, you know, to have a picnic. This is, um, and they're feeding each other dirt. 
clearly this place got to their heads and they 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 went crazy. Um, and I'm going through the the verses of that song, trying to remember. Okay, was there was there one about two people who came out here yes. and like and and yeah. went crazy and and I ate think dirt. that I think that's the um, that's good. Yeah, I um I, I I'm not going to make you roll a ruin wrong for the, a ruin roll for this uh, for the shanty like I did Basso because your verse was a little bit more um, ambiguous than Basso's was. But uh, was there a verse about two lovers who <laughs> I think died. there was and I think yeah. at the time it didn't make any sense and I was listening to it you know intently and they, and they just they ate died dirt in and place. died what? Yeah. But, um and now I'm looking and you're like oh that's this is this is what that verse was about um and I think just the the realization kind of because I because I've learned something it kind of makes the this like whole scene slightly less horrifying because I'm distracted by the, Oh, okay. Th- th- that click. You will notice. I assume you head back to camp. Yeah. yeah. What are you wearing? First of all, how do you look? Um, I think I've started putting the clothes back on because it's, it's cooled off a little bit now that the sun's down and also the mosquitoes are terrible. So I think I have this, military-esque jacket um that doesn't actually have any you know uh um military you know markings on it and uh probably some kind of hat uh i haven't uh started smearing myself with mud yet although that might be coming tomorrow if that i'll, I'll have to see how well it worked for uh Basso. um but uh you know it's definitely i'm definitely keeping it in mind see if it worked I will tell you that as you return that military jacket that you wear, you notice that sprouted across the arms of it is a fine carpet of tendrils, small tendrils. And the tendrils are almost like a, um, like a fiber optic thing. Like they kind of, they kind of glow a color, perhaps to reflect your mood. What color are they when you find them the first time? Blue. Kind of a pale blue. Okay. And Orlin, you have the easy watch, the watch that you get to have after everyone's slept for a few after you've slept for a few hours. The early, early morning watch. I don't need much from you here, but I do want to know what do you start to, how do you start to be aware that the Fen is waking up? I think there's like strange breathing sounds that were happening during the night um, that you just sort of like get used to sort of like geysers popping and stuff like that. Um, But in the morning, it sounds like a groan. Um, that like verberates uh, across everything as those stops and it like um, slowly transitions into different sort of uh, respiratory sounds. Nice. Best to get a move on before the sun gets too high, make as much ground or cover as much ground as you can. I'm sure that would, that's what Cassian would advise us because Cassian is a skilled tracker and expeditioner a gazetteer if you will <laughs> yeah um although first i think i i think i wake up as i hear that groan and I'm like oh that's the frogs here are so loud and but it's not nearly as annoying as the slurping sounds <laughs> orlin keeps making <laughs> <laughs> and you know, get, get you know kind of Look at our stuff. Why do we even have a fire? We don't need to cook any of this. And, you know, start taking a bite of the hardtack and, you know, kick kick some mud on the fire and, uh, you know, kind of roust uh, don't, don't eat all, Basso out of bed. Don't, don't, don't eat all your hardtack. Don't eat all of it. S- no, I wasn't going to eat all of it. No, did you say? <laughs> Eventually. No, you're, you're right. The more you say, we can forage today. Don't, don't eat all your prepared rations. 
I'm going to save more for later. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good idea. Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> and I like break off most of it and put it back. <laughs> also creeps me out, but he's right. Each of you has now a sort of strange condition affecting your body. A colony of tiny red spiders that is maybe spreading, who knows? Strange luminescent tendrils, a slug for a tongue. How does, how do these new features of your body, how do they greet the morning? Hmm. I, I imagine that the hand itself is doing that thing like when a spider walks like the hand itself is doing this like as I'm around and kind of like it's stretching and waking up um, outside of my own volition and just to be clear oh, yes, for, that, our audio only, for our audio only podcast and my, lol. my hand is that the fingers are undulating like spider yes. walking along a log or whatnot. Perfect. Orlin, what about your tongue? Hmm. Um, I kind of like the idea that it becomes less uh, slurpy so that when I get the jab that I was making that all night, I wasn't even really aware of it. And it's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. So I'm all like grumbly and old manny about it and <laughs> stuff like my jowls quiver. And I'm like, don't need to say whatever's on your mind all the time. <laughs> what about the glowing tendrils the fine almost fur of glowing tendrils on your jacket um, they change color to. it's almost like they're reflecting the sunlight coming down through the leaves so they're this bright yellow green and um, I think it's I think they actually become less obvious because of that because they you know like it could be just reflecting where last night it was they were clearly glowing on their own this is a shitty day <laughs> i mean bad you notice it at first in bursts dragonflies Flying roaches, moths smacking against you, little swamp beetles crawling over your boots, and then it picks up the pace. And before you know it, you are walking through a cloud of insects. And I want to impress upon you the thickness of this cloud. If we were to look down upon it from our aerial camera view, we would see it would look like it would look like a smog, like a black smog. It's so thick you can't even see, but a few feet in front of you, you will lose sight of your companions. And we have different dangers here. The danger of the bugs biting you, possibly poisoning you, but at the very least chewing off great big bits of your skin. It's very uncomfortable. Centipedes and other nasty things getting inside your boots. Another danger, you might actually get split up. You may lose track of each other. Cassian, you seem to be the most equipped possibly for this, but uh, maybe Basso too, who has a, a history of evading and escaping things. But in any case, I'm going to ask each of you in turn, starting with Cassian, how do you cope with this? Like, how do you try to survive this? I mean, I want to emphasize how disgusting this is. There's the bugs are so thick. They are literally just like spattering against your flesh and your skin, like a, like a water hose, right? It's just, just like, rah, 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 right. What do you do, Cassian? Um, I think at first, like I'm just trying to swat them going like this, like, like I have been 
camera actually because there's gnats in the room. <laughs> um, um, and like to the point where I'm like smacking myself in the face to try to, you know, kill them as they hit my skin. And then I look over at Basso, or you know, I, I remember looking over at Basso last time and uh, it's like, oh, well, I don't know how well it works for sunscreen, but, and I just pick up like handfuls of sticky clay and just cover myself with it to like, so that the, the bugs will just get stuck in the clay. You almost have like an armor of bugs yep. like as they hit the clay. That's that's quite a sight. Um, what about you, Orlin? How will you cope with the bugs? I'm old. I don't deal with this shit. I cast Gale. <laughs> ah, nice. We like Gale. That's good. What about you, um, Basso? What's your strategy? Uh, getting some cloth over the nose and mouth to try and keep them out of there trying to keep my head down, keeping my eyes as best I can on to Cassian because Cassian has that map and uh, waving with my web infested hand to try and keep, keep that away from my, my face, but, but kind of hunched. I'm, I'm like, I'm like a, like a, like a, a, a just kind of a hunched troll at this point following behind Nice. I love it. I'm going to let Cassian's role stand for you, uh, Basso, as well. And then I'm going to have Orlin roll separately for the Gale. Cassian, this is utterly miserable. Why is it so important that you endure this? Why is it so important that you publish your father's discoveries about old Kaldor? What is so important about that, that this, that cockroaches flying in your mouth is worth it? Because I was supposed to come on this expedition with him. And I didn't. A couple days before I, I got sick and I couldn't come. Except, like, I wasn't that sick. I just really didn't want to come. Where is your father now? Don't know. He never came back. But he came into the fen. Yeah. Hmm. So you hope to second find, or third trip. You hope to find him, and failing that, his discoveries. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I have some of his research from before that trip, but then, you know, I don't know what he discovered on his final trip. Obviously. So the mud. I think this is a great idea. Let's take a look. Uh, you've already kind of stated what you intend to accomplish. How could this go wrong, Lowell and Fraser? Any thoughts? <laughs> oh, yeah. I think that uh, that it'll protect, but there'll be plates and sections that will adhere to the skin when it dries out. Um, and you'll have to choose whether you're going to leave it there and have the weight of that there or tear it off. Like, like and the skin is going to come away like panels, like like wax ripping off that flesh at the top. That's a devil's that's, bargain. I think it's it, kind of more of a devil's bargain, but I do like it. It gives me some <laughs> ideas for sure. Fraser, what do you think? What could go wrong? Um, I think maybe there's just too many of the bugs. They like, like it works for a time, but there's so many that uh, they overwhelm the, the mud Plate yeah, I, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest that it just, it just doesn't work, and they just overcome you and chew off your flesh, and so passes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cassian, the Cassian Junior, I suppose. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's great. Let's take a look at your die pool. So, and actually, before we get to this die roll, I want to, I want to ruin roll from all three of you because this is grotesque and horrifying. This amount of bugs. Mine goes up to four. Mine's four, so it stays, I think, right? If it's the same number? Uh, no, if it's equal, it actually goes up. I've been playing oh, that wrong. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Mine, goes, well, then. mine goes up to four as well. All right. So what do you, and so what do you go up to, Fraser? I go or up to five. Buses, <laughs> buses are five, okay. Or uh, Orlin, rather, is at five. So Orlin's at five. Cassian's at four. Basso's at four. We'll talk about the, the, I think for each of you, 
your current condition is just going to intensify. And we'll talk about that once we get past this particular danger. So Cassian, let's talk about your die pool. Getting back to that. Yeah. Do you get a light die because of your skills? Um, no, I don't think I don't sharp shooting surveillance, surveillance tracking. tracking appraisal. No, I don't think so. Um, did you want to offer th- Lowell, offer up your, your offer previous thing as a devil's bargain? The, 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 the mud clops. Okay. Yeah. I'll take that. Yeah. So this, so just to rephrase it again, like basically it, it like tears your skin to, to tear it, it off. Is that the, the idea? Some of it will, it's a, the, he'll have to leave ch- some chunks of it on or, or else pull it off and, and suffer like the skin being torn away. And I think I'll even just, I'll deepen it a little bit and say that no matter what, I think that those tendrils start to grow from those places too. So mm-hmm. it'll like be like on your body as well. Sure. So you have a light die. Do you want to go ahead and throw your dark die in or wait? You can wait till after the fact. Um, I'll wait till after. Okay, go ahead. So I got a four. Uh, four is complication, success with the complication. Complication could be that I think the complication is going to be, you're going to lose something valuable, possibly the map. <laughs> um, do you want to add a dark die in to try to get a six? No, I think I'm avoiding ruin. Uh, so, like I, I, I think at this point, um, I would rather suffer physical, harm yeah. and pain than than mental yeah so fair. uh so i'll take that four okay uh so the complication is going to be that i think the map gets torn up in the process but do otherwise describe how you are able to save uh yourself and basso from the worst of it um yeah i, th- I think that uh i get this idea from from basso so makeshift sunscreen but i just like i find that the stickiest clay i can and just like slather it on like inches thick and it's heavy but then i turned to boss and i was like just do what you've been doing but more <laughs> <laughs> um and we both like walk through and we come out just covered with like layers and layers of like layer of clay, layer of bugs, layer of clay, layer of bugs. This is and so we're gross. like, like swamp people coming I out of the it. swarm. Orlin, you have a different plan. Tell us about your ritual. Um, I think I have a staff kind of like the Attenborough in Jurassic Park with like the, Oh yeah. yeah. It's like a walking staff, but it has the, amber with like a a bug in it Mm -hmm. i have some sort of creature in there as well except there's like a um like a little hole where i put my blood to awaken the ritual and uh, and begin it so as i walk with it there's like maybe a, a a healthy wound in my thumb or something like that that presses to it to to continue the feeding it nice i love it uh so you're it's pretty clear what you're trying to accomplish you want to create a, a wind to keep the bugs away from you. Uh, any thoughts on what could go wrong here? I feel like there's many, but <laughs> seems like a perfect plan. Really, <laughs> it really does. Yeah. <laughs> one of these, one of the smaller insects crawls into the wound. Ooh, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, that sounds like a double bargain, actually. But it could, depending on how we play it, could be a failure too. Lol, what do you think? Oh, I think I think that uh, uh, if you fail. Uh, that you'll, you'll get the, the bugs out of the way, but uh, we still have that beast that is lurking. And the sound and the howl of that gale will draw Oh, yeah, them. yeah. Draws it faster. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I don't have anything to add to that. Let's take a look at your die pool. So you are going to get no light die, as best I can tell. <laughs> But I'll make you a devil's bargain. Devil's bargain is the ritual unlocks consciousness in your tongue. And it will try to communicate with you. (laughs) I like that. That sounds cool. So you have a light die now. 
And of course you have to do a dark die because you're doing a ritual. Oh, <laughs> gotcha. Okay. And I push my fellows for two stress. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I got a six on the light yes. die. Oh, good. Lucky, lucky move. Uh, it works great. Describe it. Um, so I take a, probably a letter opener, because I'm an old man, and I stick my uh, thumb to it and it make a healthy gash. And um, I think the staff is carved from bone. At the top, there's amber with some strange uh, bug, probably like a mosquito, but strange. Maybe there's like eight pairs of wings and like two suckers on it or something like that. And there's a hole at the top and I press my thumb to it and we see the blood bleed down. And the the thing that we thought was dead inside the amber uh, reaches up with its sucker and starts uh, sucking on the blood and then the wings beat. And that's when the the wind uh, comes at my back. Nice. And your companions can't see it but your tongue has pressed its way out of your mouth and is swaying back and forth. Um, uh, sort of almost like as if to a song, uh, whispering tiny words that we can't hear yet. A beautiful moment a reprieve a glorious divine peace there is a path part of the ruins of ancient Kaldur which are spread throughout the world a stone walkway probably part of a larger structure but now that's all fallen away and all that's left is this stone walkway. And on either side of the stone walkway are statue depictions of the sisters. The sisters are saints, saints who the various occupations and trades of the world um, venerate. And I want to really emphasize the almost religious or, yeah, the sort of religious nature of this moment, the, 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 the touch of the divine that's happening here, because the bugs won't come within 15 or 20 feet of this path lined with these saint statues in fact the bugs create this buzzing arch like a domed ceiling above the walkway and their buzzing even starts to take on a sort of like a choral quality occur you know a sort of like chorus like quality right and you're walking along this path and you will each find the statue of the sister that your occupation is loyal to. I want to know from each of you a little bit about the sister, their name, if you have it, but otherwise just a general description of them is fine. And whether and how you observe rites at their statue. I imagine that for me, it's it's not, of course, not exactly my thing, but I imagine that it is, uh, we'll call her Arona, and she's the sister of the, the wood gatherer, the person who goes out into the woods to pick up the loose wood and that kind of thing. It is the, the person who scavenges, who picks up, doesn't hunt things, but goes and finds and collects things. And I imagine that she is is bowed with this great big sack of things on her back and 
I take that stick that I brought with me uh, and I, I break it in half. Um, and then I kind of carefully climb up and put one of the halves on that backpack to give her something else to carry forward. Um, and I'm, I'm praying with all my might. I love it. Who wants to go next? Uh, Nima is the sister venerated by both soldiers and explorers since there there's a lot of overlap and uh i walk up and i take the small scrap of the map that i still have it's covered with mud and like blood from you know squashing bugs that have sucked my blood um on it but it's still kind of readable and the the blood almost like it looks almost like new new um like markings on the map and i just uh place it in the statue's hand and then step back in like a bow and i think i did i think i back away i think it is bad luck to turn your back on nima nice orlin um mine i think is everest the and it's historian so i think she has uh, spectacles on and is carrying some parchment and i think to pay reverence what i do is i uh, sign my name with some of my own blood i guess since i've already got it handy and um as an offering i think just some some more parchment maybe there's like a um a satchel type thing on the statue where you can place it in there nice you finish your rites you continue along the path hearing this chorus of insectoid angels above you you step off the path You're putting the cloud of insects behind you, getting ever closer to the flocculent cathedral. The camera pulls away back to our favorite shot, the overhead shot. And we see whatever this creature is that's following you and that has been following you for some time now. It's big enough to shake the treetops. <laughs> and that concludes ring two. <laughs> <laughs>